Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fully live Friday episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today it's just me and my struggling computer as Killian is off again uh, doing PTO stuff. So hope you're having fun, Killian. But uh, good to see everybody on the stream today. I saw a lot of people in the chat before we even got started. And um, yeah, my computer's making a lot of noises. That's why I'm a little bit late. The camera just cut out. So if I vanish at some point, then just, you know, act like act like I'm invisible. I don't know. But uh, all right, so we have lots of news to go through today and also some other things I just want to shout out. So we had a lot of people asking like, hey, is there a place to carry on the conversation after these streams? Like a lot of the time I get here, the stream is just picking up, I'm starting to talk to other people and then boom, it's gone. Well, yes, I went ahead and created a Discord community that is constantly evolving. We're going to be shifting things around and stuff, but I wanted to get it out there. I just dropped it in the chat. So if you are having a good time on the stream, if you want to continue the conversation, maybe keep networking with other people you're talking to, or even just get your question in to make sure that it gets answered on the next stream, you can check it out here. Uh, boop, there it is. And, uh, you know, we're, as I said, continuing to set it up. I see we've got like 16 people so far uh, from the last stream. Really good to see. And then we have our live Q&A thing. So if you have a question for the live Q&A, you can go ahead and pop it in here. And not only can I answer it probably before I even address it on the stream, but it'll be, you know, enshrined for other people to be able to come back and find in the future. I think the, the hardest thing sometimes is we answer so many great questions and we don't really like record them anywhere. So you kind of have to go back and watch some of our streams in order to get answers to those questions. So trying to break that out a little bit more and provide a place where all of our people in our community can, um, you know, come and have a conversation. And of course, if you ended up uh, supporting us by picking up one of our nuggets and you can also ask questions about them. Um, so yeah, go ahead and check this out if you want to continue the conversation after the stream and uh, you maybe want to submit a question that gets guaranteed to be answered uh, on our Wednesday Q&A stream. So very cool. Thank you to everybody who encouraged me to do this as well. Um, it's been a while in the making and I, I don't like to create Discord servers without having kind of a plan for it. But this one is going to be a home for our community, a place for us to post our content when we do it, and also a place for people who are using our hardware to come and ask us questions or share their projects. So um, thank you to everybody who helped set this up. And also thank you to Aria, who was our guest on the last stream, who's a uh, definitely in the server willing to answer questions about hardware i think the best part of the last stream we did was we found out that we could use a raspberry pi pico as like a logic level analyzer and being able and be able to like see the kinds of data that was uh sent directly between like sensors and other peripherals with hardware super cool stuff so if you haven't seen it check it out and a big shout out to her for appearing on the stream last time all right so what else do we have going on well some things I wanted to shout out. Um, last year at DEF CON, I was privileged to be the point of contact for a group of Norwegian journalists who are working with the Norwegian Institute of Journalism um, to learn hacker stuff. So we had some great uh, presentations by Miko Hopkinen. I'm not great at pronouncing his last name. I'm sorry, Miko. I think that's easier. Um, I got to meet him. He was really great. Uh, they interviewed him for a number of different things. And I was really uh, pleased to see the result of some of this investigative journalism come out a couple of days ago. So um, if you happen to speak Norwegian, which I absolutely do not, uh, then I think you'll enjoy the way this was cut together. And there's a lot of English parts as well. This is like kind of like going into the cyber war um, with Ukraine. And it, as you can see, has footage from DEF CON where I was the one uh, kind of leading these people around and introducing them to the hacker community. Um, it's so cool to see what journalists ended up doing with everything they got uh, at DEF CON. They really took what we gave them and ran with it. So if you want to see some cool stuff, I will drop the link to this. Again, it is in Norwegian. Um, I haven't figured out how to make the subtitles English. Not sure if you can, but if you figured out, please let me know because I've just been watching the English parts. And also, uh, Miko is a fascinating speaker. He has a lot of really interesting perspectives on um, cyber war and where technology is going. So uh, yeah, I, I got to watch this earlier and I felt indirectly a tiny bit responsible for it by introducing these journalists to their sources and bringing them to DEF CON. So uh, yeah, I was really, really pleased with this. And as always, uh, if you haven't seen Nico, um, he's very famous in Norway and, and other places around there. So uh, his interview in this was also quite good. I'm trying to scrub around and find. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's Miko. Um, so one of my favorite parts of DEF CON was getting to sit in and listen to uh, Miko Hop. See, it's it's not just me. The last name's a little bit hard for Americans. Um, but he gave a really great talk on like where things are going with cyber work or in the future. Um, yeah, so this was a great piece of content. Again, it's in Norwegian. Sorry about that, everyone. But I was sort of indirectly involved in uh, producing some of it uh, by introducing them to their sources. And I wanted to give them a shout out for doing an incredible job. So super cool. Um, and I was really pleased to see that this week. Um, also some cool stuff with the Flipper. So everybody knows that the Flipper has like GPIO. 
Uh, it has stuff you can plug into it. It's been cool to see people on my timeline um, actually doing cool things with uh, uh, electronics. You can do it. Now, for me, it's a little bit expensive for me to be plugging stuff in and have it potentially fry like a GPIO port. Like I can think of like 10 other micro uh, controllers I would use before the flipper uh, to do this. However, again, it is really cool to see these projects coming out where people are building apps um, and making it so that you can do cool and interesting, <laughs> cool and interesting things within the flippers environment. Kind of an inspiration to me as a hardware designer um, and uh, something that I like very much. Ah, uh, yes. Can I link this in the Discord? I sure can. Yes, I can. In fact, I'll do it right now since I'm the one operating the stream and also hosting it. Look at that. Look at that. I'm going to go to the general chat. Hello, everyone. Hello, PHP my admin. And here is, I should drop these in a dedicated thing, but what are you going to do? OK, all right, let's keep going. So we also have, so I used to be a writer at Nullbyte. And there is a problem for cybersecurity writers. It is the fact that it's really hard to find good um, like stock photos for like some of these really abstract articles. And I think that um, Bleeping Computer is one of these uh, outfits that like frequently has this problem. I was kind of looking last night as I was going through the stories. I was noticing like uh, this, this little, you know, this little chain doesn't even go all the way up. Like, is this AI generated? Like, could it be? And I ended up reverse uh, looking it up on Google. And I found like, no, this is actually just like stock footage that's been out for a while, it looks like. Um, however, I was able to then just describe this to Bing's free image generator. And I was able to get something that I thought was about as good. Uh, so it's a really interesting time that one of the most annoying things about making cybersecurity content, especially written cybersecurity content, which is like, you know, like finding these stupid stock photos that look like halfway like what you're describing. Um, while I did get a lot of my queries on being blocked because they were, I said, like hacker or criminal, um, I even took some, I did an experiment to see if I could take some of the first, just the first paragraph of uh, an article by Bleeping Computer, put it into Bing Image Creator, and then get headline images. And it turns out, because they cover cybercrime so much, those are all like banned words, and I wasn't able to get any output that was very good. But I was still pretty impressed to see that this might actually be a solved problem for uh, cybersecurity writers. So Bleeping Computer, take note. You know, your days of having to sift through the same couple of uh, images that I see every single week might be might be numbered, because these are... Um, Zam also pointed out that there are there are definitely some cursed things here going on. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not perfect. But I will say this is this is a problem that has been there for a while. And also, um, one of my followers uh, pointed out there's a typo in this bleeping computer article, which we're actually going to get to in a little bit. Um, plug walk Joe uh, was called plug walk joke. That's not very nice. Get get on it, bleeping computer. All right, so then uh, I like to talk about tools every so often. And the dumbest of tools, sometimes it's just a strategy. Some types of facial recognition really don't do well with multiple faces. And uh, can Bing make a good picture of my cat? Um, yes, actually, Midjourney did a little bit better. Um, Midjourney did a version of my cat that was like a hot air balloon and that was like going over this like gorgeous valley uh, that really was stunning. But um, yeah, but Bing, like I would say, is a close second. It's really annoying to me that they've started um, blocking specific terms. Uh, however, I will say, you want to know my favorite escape on Bing? I'll tell you guys right now. Um, if there's a banned term on Bing, uh, image creator that you want to create anyway, just misspell it. Just use the most common misspelling and it gets around the block like pretty effectively. There were a couple things that it just would not create for me that I thought were dumb. So I just misspelled them um, in a way that made sense to my brain. And I was like, oh, it's not banned. But then I realized I was actually misspelling it and that's how I was getting around the block on certain uh, like image creation words. So Bing is still, I think, uh, surprisingly one of the best places you can go to make like stock images and stuff like that. So if you're if you're interested in just creating stuff, I've been using it to make all sorts of things. In fact, I believe that the server image for uh, for our Discord server is AI generated. So yeah, lots of cool art that you can do there, but a lot of it's kind of locked down. So anyway, back to this. Um, a lot of AI systems that are doing facial recognitions really suck at dealing with multiple faces. They'll kind of like lock on one and ignore the other. So I was able to determine that like regular sunglasses would not work to defeat this relatively basic facial recognition system. It was a little bit better than um, just using a microcontroller and uh, it, it uses Python like a full system in order to do a, a decent job of getting through obstacles like sunglasses or other things that might confuse like a cheaper version. Um, however, putting a tiny little face on the cor corner of your sunglasses actually did a pretty good job of confusing the system. So if you're looking for a way to mess up facial recognition, um, this might be it. Uh, go ahead and try it. Let me know if it works. Um, 
I use a completely jailbroken LLM. Are you talking about Llama, bro? Because I do it too. Um, Llama is awesome. And the Dalai project is a great way of getting access to the leaked language models that were kind of put out like Alpaca and then Llama that were, one of them was put out by uh, Meta and the second one is a trained version of that. There's some super cool projects where I can make my computer exceptionally hot uh, by running a little web server on my, on my MacBook Pro and running my own like unlocked like large language model. It's really cool. So yeah, definitely check it out. It seems like some other people have tried that as well. Um, all right. All right. Let's move on to the next thing. So this is probably one of the worst stories of the week. And I just wanted to shout this out specifically. Um, so uh, Toyota has disclosed that they had a really uh, interesting breach. So this is not so much, I wouldn't even call it a breach. It was a misconfiguration um, that was publicly exposing the real-time position of vehicles using certain services. So that means not every Toyota in the world here was exposed, but frequently when we talk about like hacking cars, we're not really hacking you know, the, the engine or something. We're hacking like a telematic system or something built into the car by the manufacturer that's either switched on in the background or optionally switched on. Some of these systems have unfortunately been uh, maintained by third party providers that just didn't do a good job. Um, and this is frequently what we'll see. We'll see the car service be like, oh no, OnStar really messed up again. But it's like ev like almost every Nissan or whatever that's built in with this standard could be vulnerable to being like remotely unlocked or some other stuff like that. So. When we talk about car hacking, the, the modern car hacker isn't focused on necessarily like the key fob or like any of the things you might expect. Instead, they're looking at remote services because in order to break into a car um, with full knowledge of all the technology going on along it with it, and if it's a newer car, you might have a better chance just copying the VIN number, which is perfectly visible from it sitting there, and then using that to hack into the back end service of the car and let yourself in. Okay, so what happened here? So, um, Toyota had one of these telematic systems um, that was, uh, oh yes, it was discovered that the data the Toyota Motor Corporation entrusted to Toyota Connected Corporation to manage has been made publicly available due to misconfiguration of the cloud environment. So looks like Toyota Motor Corporation um, throwing Toyota Connected Corporation under the bus here a little bit. Uh, they trusted them and they were betrayed. But, but they both say Toyota. So like, what is going on here? Anyway, um, what exactly was happening is the G-Link, G-Link Lite, or G-Book services, which are something that are, are built into Toyotas and are, or are optional things that can be turned on, were public facing. That means that the in-vehicle GPS uh, terminal ID number, chassis number, vehicle location information with time data, all were exposed. So what would you be able to really, like, what's the impact of this? Well, it seems as though if you had the vehicle's VIN number, you could just get to know exactly where the target's car was at all times. Um, the VIN and chassis number is easily accessible. So obviously somebody who just walks up to the vehicle uh, is able to see it and then potentially get physical access to the car um, by locating it. And uh, again, this isn't as severe as some of the other like things that we've seen where by getting the VIN number, you can unlock the car, but getting real-time access to someone's vehicle is, um, real-time access to someone's location information from their vehicle is definitely still a big deal. So this is so big of a deal that they have pledged to set up a call center specifically for, and also send out apology emails to anybody impacted. Um, so it seems like a, seems like a pretty big deal. Um, yeah, so this is, again, probably the worst story of the week just because so many vehicles were impacted. And um, while they say that there was no evidence of exploitation, like it, it does certainly seem that if you're publishing this information just publicly on the internet that somebody might have seen it at some point. But who knows? Um, definitely interesting to see. All right, uh, let's move on to more stories. So this is probably my favorite story of the week. This is Corellium. So if anybody um, knows what Corellium is, it is a service that allows you to simulate um, iOS and test things out. It's like a service for security researchers. And it's something that allows us to, you know, hack away at iOS and treat it just like any other operating system. Virtualization is a pretty standard part of, of ev everything now, because like when we're testing Android apps, you know, we'll, we'll simulate an Android device and we'll try it out on that rather than trying to have like every Android device known to man, you know, like sitting in our closet or something that we can test things out on. So this is really standard for security researchers. And Apple has been pretty aggressive here, repeatedly trying to go after Corellium. And uh, it seems like they finally failed to revive their lawsuit against Corellium. This is a pretty major win for security researchers and anybody who wants these platforms to be auditable. And um, the, the the most important thing here is that the judge ruled that Corellium's product is uh, like, you know, a service 
for advancing the technology. It is transformative. It is outside the domain of copyright. And it means that Apple cannot use its copyright to stifle innovation uh, around its product in this case. So really good. Um, happy to see this. Not a lot of good, good news on the show sometimes. But uh, yeah, it, it is a, a win for people who audit iOS systems and who want the platform to be more easy for people to discover vulnerabilities in. All right, so this is probably uh, the biggest story of the week, and that is going to be the FBI nuking the Russian snake data theft malware with the self-destruct command. So what is going on here? Well, when you need to exfiltrate lots of sensitive information, it's pretty easy to shut down infrastructure that you don't own. What it looks like is that, uh, I think it was like in the start of 2000, and actually, no, no, this, this started like the 90s, if I remember this article right. Um, so in like the 90s, this branch of the Russian um, security apparatus decided that they wanted to be able to exfiltrate information via its own network uh, that was a clandestine, like infected network of computers around the world. So think of like Tor, but like evil and like only working for the Russian government and then also running on infected computers instead of ones that are voluntarily running it. So what the goal of this was, it was to create uh, an infrastructure that is incredibly difficult to take down so that it's not using conventional means in order to exfiltrate information that's incredibly sensitive um, back to Russia. So um, this also, these governments go, get so serious about their name. Um, so development of the snake malware started under the name Ouroboros in the late 2003. And then uh, I guess the Five Eyes Nation decided to create, Five Eyes Nations decided to create something called Perseus in order to slay this thing. So it, there's a lot of mythology and stuff going on here, but it, what it was designed to do is allow communication with this network and basically um, allow somebody who was not supposed to be able to access the network to intercept communications and also be able to uh, issue commands along the network. So first they were able to um, infiltrate this and find out that there was information from like NATO and other organizations that was, ah, yes, um, uh, NATO and US devices compromised by snake malware. Um, they sent something that was able to uninstall uh, all of the malware that was running on affected computers without impacting the operations of the computers. Um, and that's a pretty tall task, like being able to remove uh, like an infection from all these computers without also crashing some of them is pretty difficult to do. So the fact that they did this and then they made it such a high priority is uh, definitely a testament to how important this network was for exfiltrating stolen information. So yeah, a lot of time we we don't know exactly what sort of infrastructure hacking groups are using um, that's above and beyond what we might expect, like the Tor network or something like that. But for like highly sensitive things that you definitely want to get back to you that you don't want touching a public network like Tor, this was a major operation for the FSB. And it seems like now that it's been taken down, a major blow for the infrastructure responsible for delivering some of this classified information that's being stolen. Yeah, hopefully without messing up these devices. You know, like it's it's for the greater good. If a couple of computers had to get killed here, I feel like the U.S. government probably signed off on that. Um, but the fact that uh, oh yes, and the nicknames here are, are, are also something I find very funny. Um, water bug or venomous bear. What a horrifying thing to think about. A venomous bear. Like stop introducing new nightmares into this already frightening uh, scenario. Um, so yes, they've been orchestrating cyber espionage campaigns, and it's pretty cool um, just seeing like how far, honestly, they were able to spread this like over the course of you know, however long they were running this. Looks like they um, there are suspects behind attacks with the U.S. Central Command, the Pentagon, NASA, Eastern European Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the uh, Finnish Foreign Ministry. So they had a lot of very high profile targets that had information uh, exfiltrated through this snake network, which is uh, now apparently destroyed. All right, moving on. Next up, um, we have, I don't care about this one. We're going to skip this one. It's, we have so much to go over. I want to talk about this one. So I've talked a lot about QR codes and how they can potentially be a problem. I kind of wonder where this one goes, honestly. But people are naturally curious about QR codes. So when I used to work as a security guard, um, I would have instances where like a show would be moved or something. And I would put up a sign that says, your show is downstairs, go downstairs for the show. And people would just get in line and they wouldn't read it. So sometimes I would just put print out a giant QR code and put it right before they talk to me on like a placard facing them. And a lot of the times people would actually scan the QR code to see what it said while they waited for a second for the person before them to get in. And they would find out that the show had been moved downstairs and then just leave me alone. 
Um, people's natural curiosity to scan a QR code and the inability to tell exactly what's in it is a big problem. And that is something that cyber criminals have been using pretty creatively. So I used QR codes to uh, basically be able to track people's phones by having them connect to a Wi-Fi network that constantly has their phones screaming out the name of the network because it's hidden. Uh, and it doesn't tell you that when you scan it, but it does make your phone into a big fat tracking device where if I'm in range of your phone via Wi-Fi, which is pretty much line of sight, I can tell basically where you are. Um, this is some novel attacks that took things uh, in a rather predictable fashion um, towards financial crime. And the victims here actually attempted to use a QR code to download um, an app from a bubble tea shop. So frequently you'll go to one of these restaurants and they'll have QR codes as their menu or they'll just have them out in an area that's publicly accessible. And this makes me cringe because I have a little thermal printer and I love printing out bar or QR codes and sticking them on top of other QR codes. It is super easy to do and it is hard to tell that that is not the QR code that's supposed to be there. And sometimes the menu changes and maybe they'll just go out and stick a new QR code on top of the old one anyway. So it's not even that suspicious looking. Most people will just do it. In this case, a Singapore woman lost $20,000 after she scanned a QR code and downloaded an app, which uh, overnight like, apparently drained her bank account um, after gaining access to her phone. So obviously there's some pretty sophisticated levels of how bad this can get, but there's also some pretty simple ones. So let's say that you're a parking, uh, like a parking lot and you want people to scan a QR code to pay for their parking. Well, uh, it seems as though another version of this story went where someone was trying to pay for parking and then ended up paying a phishing site instead that looked, you know, relatively like the parking website, but instead did not give them any parking. They probably got their car towed and um, it charged them uh, for something that it just wasn't even selling. So be careful with QR codes. If you are going to pay something based on a QR code, make sure that the QR code hasn't been tampered with. Um, <laughs> I do that all the time. Frequently, I will uh, send someone to a funny website, but uh, it's just as easy to send them to a malicious website. So if you see QR codes out in the open and they can be manipulated or messed with or modified or changed, um, be a little bit cautious before scanning them because you really are going to have a hard time telling what is a legitimate website and what is not a legitimate website if you've never been there before, especially if you're in like a parking lot or something. And the fact that somebody got their whole ass device compromised by scanning this and then like downloading an application which ended up being malicious, this is a new frontier, especially for small businesses that, you know, might not notice if this was swapped out. If you have your customers thinking they're going to get like 20% off by downloading your Boba Tea app, but instead it steals $20,000 from their bank account, um, it's just too easy of a crime for people. I mean, if people are going to be credit card skimming at gas stations, then you can expect that they will do this as well because it's just as easy, you know, especially with chat GPT to help with writing the, the lookalike website or some of these other like AI assisted tools. It really is a good time for those who are looking to make a phishing website and spread it by means like a malicious QR code. So again, be careful with those QR codes. Um, it's, uh, it's very funny. Um, I love QR codes. I have, I've done a couple of articles on QR codes and how you can use them to mess things up and they're always really popular. So I'm, I'm not surprised to see that more people have found other ways of messing with QR codes. Okay. Oh, look at that. Um, so we've talked about, um, BPFD, uh, or Berkeley packet filter door. It's, it's kind of like a backdoor thing where, you use a Berkeley packet filter to listen for like magic packets, which can be basically sent from anywhere, uh, which allow the attacker to initiate a connection with this dev uh, Linux device and then do all sorts of bad things. What's notable about this is that it is incredibly stealthy and it had been operating for a long time, since 2017, without being discovered um, until about a year ago when it was first found. So the Berkeley packet filter is something that sits um, within the network communication and filters out packets based on a set of rules. And what's interesting about this malware is it, it uses this rule set to kind of define the way that it behaves and be extremely stealthy so that uh, people who are infected really have very little, oops, I'm still, I'm still pinning this comment. You can't even see me. Um, and uh, make it so that operators have very little indication that anything is going on here because it won't, it literally won't do anything suspicious until it receives a packet with like a, uh, a magic number that kind of kicks it on and allows it to establish a reverse shell or something else. So what's interesting about this new variant that just came out is it uses static library encryption. Uh, so it's harder to find, its libraries are encrypted. 
Um, it uses a reverse shell as opposed to a bind shell in IP table. So this makes it able to call out and basically, uh, instead of having something call in, be able to call out and evade firewall rules. So that means that if you have firewall rules that are preventing suspicious communication from coming in, this will get around it because uh, you'll actually have the infected device um, dialing out. So the other things that were interesting about this update is there are no longer any hard-coded commands. All commands are sent through the reverse shell, and there's nothing hard-coded in the actual malware itself. That means that um, it's the kind of like very simple C2 server communication that was happening before is now happening in a reverse shell, and there's nothing that can allow someone to kind of like reverse engineer this to figure out what its functions are as easily. So now we're taking all the functionality of the script, and instead of allowing security researchers to potentially discover it, um, in the malware itself, we are now restricting that so that in order for someone to pull down these commands, they would basically need to infect themselves, connect back to the server, and then wait for commands. And that means we could do other checks to make sure it's not a honeypot or something before giving away our capabilities. Very sneaky, very sophisticated, and uh, makes it so it's way harder to detect. And of course, we also have file names which are no longer hard-coded. Um, these are all variations that have happened since the original discovery in an attempt, presumably by the original author, to make sure that this um, very, very good investment uh, stays working for a very long time. So we are definitely not done with this. If you're interested in like stealthy malware and like packet filters and stuff like this is really cool. This is one of the most interesting um, pieces of malware that I've covered in the last couple of years. So yeah, Berkeley packet filter door. Uh, <laughs> malware is definitely something I should just call it BPFD uh, door BPF door. Yeah, there you go. Um, is a, a really cool way of looking at how technology can be used to be incredibly stealthy. Um, cause it's kind of like living off the land in the way that uses something built into the Linux kernel to deal with packets and filter them in order to do the most important part of what it does. So really cool malware. Um, I mean, as, you know, as cool as like, you know, malware can be. But uh, I really find it interesting the way that this was able to evade detection for such a long time just by using these built-in tools in Linux. Super cool. Um, all right. So Brightly is warning about a school dude data breach. I'm sorry. So we're firmly in our who is getting free credit monitoring section of the show. And Brightly, um, which is a, I guess, a subsidiary of Siemens. Um, oh, I know someone. I know two people that work for Siemens. Um, is notifying customers that uh, if you are part of school dude, which the branding on that to me is just off, but uh, if you're a school dude, then you might have been breached. It seems as though this is a platform that allows over 7,000 colleges, universities, and K-12 students um, to do like work orders is, is what it seems like it is. So um, the incident involved an unauthorized actor obtaining certain account information from the school dude user database. Not really totally clear what this data is. Um, they believe the threat actor stole the information. That's going to be names, email addresses, account passwords. Account passwords. OK, well, that sucks. Phone numbers um, and school district names. So what's notable about this? Oh, yeah, I remember this article. Is the account passwords. Seems like they either weren't hashed or like something went goofy. So as a result, um, these passwords are considered to be breached. Um, if you if you use these passwords anywhere else, which I guarantee you some of these school users did, it's education. Edu of course they did. Um, it's very, very likely that you're going to see phishing attacks based on this breach. Um, as soon as the information is out there, being able to associate it with contact information and having a valid password, uh, that sucks. So while you might not be breached in your school dude account, if you did use that password anywhere else, you're going to want to change that immediately. Um, I personally am not a school dude, but I'm sure that some school dudes out there are going to, um, you know, find out. All right. So ubiquity developer who extorted the film getting six years in prison. This is, we've covered this a couple times. Um, they were convicted and we were kind of waiting to see what exactly was going to go down for this. Um, this, uh, was a data breach that ended up just being like an internal person and it ended up being, um, somebody who actually worked there. So this is, I believe, Nicholas Sharp. Uh, yes, Sharp. Yes. Um, yes, is literally the first line. So um, this is just kind of the wrap up to a story that we covered a while ago. Six years in prison for attempting to extort your former employer, I feel like is reasonable. Um, not too much, not too little. But yeah, uh, so before you attempt to make money by using your access to a tech company to, um, you know, like, get paid off, um, do realize that the Department of Justice um, may figure that out. Um, not much else there, but, um, you know, that's that's an unfortunate sentence. All right. 
So Twitter's rolling out encrypted DMs, but only for paying accounts. What a huge surprise. Is is Bleepy Computer using like AI generated images? Some of these just seem whatever. Okay, I'm not gonna, I hope they are, honestly. I think that'd be great. So um, what's to the story? Well, there's going to be encrypted image, uh, encrypted messaging coming to the Twitter platform. The rub is, of course, you have to be subscribed. You got to give Papa Elon the money if you want it. And also, if you forward anything, it doesn't work anymore. And also, you can't add other people to the conversation. Plus, also, if you have another device, you can't transfer any of the conversations over to that. And uh, you can't transfer between devices, too. So you can't add a new device. And then if you have, like, two devices, like, it, I don't know if you can see the messages on more than one. There's a lot of problems that they're still trying to work out here. So they said, don't trust it. Um, which, when you're adding a security feature... What the hell does that actually mean? Um, I would highly advise that you do not trust um, Twitter's new encrypted messaging at the moment. I mean, whoever whoever really did trust um, Twitter DMs anyway. But yeah, we'll see. We'll kind of take a wait and see approach on this and see uh, if this gets better. But for now, there's so many ways of breaking the way that this works that I would not recommend it for people who are looking for um, true security at the moment. Uh, yeah. So again, free Twitter users will not have the ability to use security. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, you can probably see, uh, how I feel about this. I don't care. I already use signal. It's, it's fine. And I don't do any encrypted messaging on Twitter. Um, I don't think that it's a good platform for that. And I don't think it's current management with its current resources is going to pull off a version that like is truly secure or a good idea, but that's just my personal opinion. I guess we'll see. All right. Next up. Google is bringing dark web monitor monitoring to all Gmail users. So in true Google fashion, uh, Google is announcing a feature that's not yet available yet. Wow, Google, I love it when you tell me about things that are coming up that I can't immediately use. I love marking it down in my calendar like your products are the highlight of my day and then waiting to see when it rolls out just for me. Uh, in this case, it appears that Google is going to allow all Gmail users to see whether or not their email address appears on the dark web and give them a security posture suggestion based on what kind of information is found around that. So it could be phishing information, passwords, really just kind of going through and trying to tell you um, what kinds of places your email address might be on the dark web. Now, this seems like an interesting feature, and it's currently available to Google One subscribers, which I forget what service that is. Seems like I'm subscribed to it on one of my 30 Google accounts, but I don't even remember what that is for. I don't know what it's for. Maybe someone could tell me again. Maybe it's for, like, extra space. Again, I don't really care. Um, it seems like this is coming soon. Um, it's not clear where this is rolling out. It's not clear how many people will get access to it initially. Um, can I just say, I'm so tired of these stupid Google, like, like rollouts where like they have a, a, like an exciting product announcement that you can't try. Like when you read this, like, what is the point? Just tell us when we can get it. So I immediately went through, and the reason I'm pissed is I wasted my time yesterday while reading through on all the stories for today and like actually tried to sign up for this to see how good it was. And of course you can't do it. So if you're watching, don't waste your time. Um, it's rolling out and you won't get to know when it's going to happen, uh, until then. And up until that moment, they will still attempt to sell you on Google One. So, um, you know, I'll let you know when it comes out, but it is, I'm just so tired of this. Like everybody wants to try stuff like the second it comes out, like why, why just announce something that like you can't access? I don't know. Okay, I'm done. Sorry. Sorry, Google. All right. Um, so now let's talk about data breaches. So sometimes we see data breaches from criminal uh, enterprises that are trying to, you know, make a ransom. And other times we see it from cyber espionage. There are some times that those two are like a, the Venn diagram between those two is just a circle. And North Korea is kind of the primary case for that. Um, North Korea often will go after uh, data for the purpose of espionage and then also for the purpose of, you know, making some Bitcoins to get around sanctions. And in this case, it seems like an investigation has revealed that North Korea expended a good amount of resources attacking Seoul National University Hospital in order to gain information on a stunning amount of people in the country um, they attributed this based on intrusion techniques in the attack, IP addresses, website um, registration details, and the use of specific language in North K Korean vocabulary. That's funny. Because, um, like, I'm not Korean. What am I going to tell them that they're wrong? But anyway, um, so at this point, it looks like 831,000 individuals, um, most of whom are uh, patients, are affected in this data breach. Obviously, there's no real knowledge of what this is going to be used for. It could be used for political purposes. It could be used for military purposes. It could be used for um, extortion purposes in an attempt to raise money. But either way, it's an interesting example of how these sorts of like medical institutions that are responsible for tons and tons of sensitive data for lots of people are becoming increasing targets. 
All right, next up, the worst story of the whole week. Congratulations, everyone. We've made it here. Um, so YouTube has decided that they want you to support poor little content creators like me by uh, blocking ad blockers. So you can't watch videos on YouTube until you disable your ad blocker or pay them for a premium subscription. Do you guys know how much money I make on my YouTube channel? Literally nothing. Nothing on Nullbyte, nothing on Hack5, and nothing on Security Forward. So please, please support me by paying Google. They need the money so bad. I'm kidding. But yeah, so this is dumb. It's basically an attempt to get people to disable their ad blockers or just not get to see YouTube, which makes me think that people will just go look at something aside from YouTube. I personally have kind of started watching a lot more TikTok content than I have on YouTube. Um, you know, I still watch YouTube content, but like, frankly, the ads annoy me um, when I'm not using an ad blocker. And I frank, I just wouldn't sit through them, honestly. I am from a generation that is like, no, that has been like slowly weaned off of ads to the point that I find them an intrusive reminder of being shouted at by my TV while attempting to enjoy a program. I, there's nothing that I want less than more advertising in my face when I'm already wasting time consuming content. So um, yeah, no, this sucks. So again, um, in typical Google product rollout, um, it's not clear who will be affected by this, where it will be rolled out, or how uh, how you can get away from it. Um, I would recommend a VPN though, because uh, if it's regional specific, then maybe just go to a region where you know that doesn't happen. But more stunningly great ideas from a company falling behind in the AI wars. Um, congratulations, Google, on your um, on your idea because as the stated beneficiary of this idea, I think it's dumb. All right, next up. Um, oh yeah, it's it's plug walk joke. Bleeping computer, you need to fix this. This is rude. Did they fix it already? I, I pointed it out, let, let me refresh. I haven't, oh, it's still here, you guys. Okay, cool. So plug walk Joe, sometimes known on the internet as plug walk joke, has pleaded guilty to multiple cybercrime offensive, uh, offenses, including SIM swapping, cyber stalking, computer hacking, hijacking high profile accounts. You might remember this from the time that like a bunch of very important people's accounts were taken over and then sold online. This is connected to that. So a lot of these attacks uh, were SIM swapping attacks. So it's porting over a phone number of a victim and then using it to gain access to all of the accounts um, under their control by resetting it uh, via 2FA codes and all that stuff. So, uh, 2FA codes are not very secure in the face of this type of attack. So being able to talk somebody into a phone company at porting over line is not that difficult. And it seems as though they were able to steal $794,000 worth of cryptocurrency, which certainly makes these SIM swapping attacks worth it in terms of financial windfall. Um, so these accounts were linked to a cryptocurrency giveaway scam allowing... <laughs> yeah, so uh, they were able to also then use their access to these things um, like Elon Musk's account, Apple, Bitcoin, Bill Gates, Uber, <laughs> and Kanye West um, to push cryptocurrency scams, allowing them to steal another $105,000, um, which is not unfunny. However, it is definitely a crime. So it seems as though this is kind of rounding the corner. I expect we'll have an update with like sentencing or something like that in the next couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the time when criminal hackers try to make a business out of what they're doing, that is when things become so traceable and so hot that there's no opportunity to walk away from it. And in this case, hijacking like Apple and Kanye West and whatever's and Elon Musk's accounts um, for financial gain is going to get you some attention. Um, so yeah, turns out that impersonating some of the richest and most powerful people in the world um, was not the most subtle way of earning a buck. All right, moving on. Uh, we have GitHub doing something moderately good. This is, this is I would consider this to be good for you, annoying for me. So as somebody that likes OSINT and likes digging around in information online, I love it when people leak secrets. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. Not for them, but for my investigation. Um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. GitHub is now going to be automatically blocking any pull request that has sensitive information. And it says that it has a very low false positive, which is which is great. Um, you know, like I, I think that there are so many times where I will paste in like credentials or something else in a test and then forget to remove them in production. And this is such a common thing that you know, developers and, and people who work with this sort of thing all the time must have it happen a lot more often than me. You know, there's uh, platforms that I use like CircuitPython, which has gotten um, so tired of this, that they've basically like moved everything over to a separate file. So like when you're committing your code file, you're not actually committing any secrets because that's that's kept in a separate file called secrets.py. 
that's just how prevalent this problem is and how many different kind of facets of the programming world have to deal with this. So GitHub is making it so that if you push something, it'll give you an alert. It'll tell you exactly um, what is the problem. It'll tell you where the secret is and then how to fix it. So um, while, of course, this is going to be annoying for people um, who are trying to push secrets deliberately, um, you know, there's, I imagine there's a way around it um, to push, remove the secret from the commit, or follow this URL to allow the secret. Okay, yeah, so there is a way of getting around this if you do want to deliberately push the secret, but most people do not. Um, they do not want to push the secrets. They're doing it by accident. They're working for a company. They're, they're contributing something to an open source project, and they forget to take it out because there's just a lot of code, and they're tired, and they've got something else going on. So this is a huge problem for security people that GitHub is trying to proactively create safeguards in their product to make sure that it's harder to do this by accident. This is a good thing. I think that this is actually really wonderful and I am happy to see it happen. Do, do, do. All right, what's up next? We got, all right, so more cybercrime. So this is a Spanish, um, Spanish police have dismantled a phishing operation that is also linked to a crime ring. This is, um, banking scams, like SMS-based phishing scams. It's a lot of like phishing and scamming. And it seems as though this was just like a criminal organization that figured out they could make money via these like other scams. And then we're using it to scale up and do things like, you know, buy money and drug or buy <laughs> like weapons and drugs and things like that. So this is the Trina, tr yeah, this organization. Uh, we're stealing credit cards, purchasing cryptocurrency and then exchanging um, with fiat money uh, going into a common box. The, the one part about the story I think is interesting is that with all of this going on, like phishing and all this stuff, when they were making all this money um, using money mules and whatever else, um, they were trying to buy money to the Dominican Republic, send money to the Dominican Republic to buy real estate. So like one of their like primary goals was like, sorry, I'm trying not to sneeze. <sighs> um, one of their primary goals was to like buy, use all this, this whole operation to buy money in the Dominican Republic. Who knows what they were thinking? Anyway, aside from that, uh, this was a pretty um, run-of-the-mill like cybercrime sting in that like there was a lot of phishing here, like trying to hide the money, like buying more criminal stuff with the with the ill-gotten gains. Um, you know, like nothing too crazy here aside from the um, the purchases of like real estate. I don't really know what that's about. All right, next up. So this is um, I even I know about Cisco. It's a huge food distribution giant, um, and they are warning about a data breach. So. My hope here is that this doesn't turn into any sort of like operations impact because as we were talking about last week, like um, there was a cold storage company that got uh, ransomware last week and that was causing like orders to be delayed and all sorts of cold storage problems um, that are a big deal because they're super time sensitive. They're often uh, dealing with either very expensive or very sensitive prod uh, products. So having your entire network taken down is a, a really big problem. In this case, it looks as though this is primary like a somebody that's trying to make money by exfiltrating information and threatening to leak it. So uh, it looks like on March 5th, 2023, Cisco became aware of a cybersecurity incident. I know that we're keeping track of the way that companies are framing their, their breaches and attacks and stuff, but um, we've had a cybersecurity event, an, an encryption event. A cybersecurity uh, event seems like a pretty good middle of the ground way of describing this. Perpetrated by an, a threat actor believed to have begun on January 14th, 2023, in which a threat actor gained access to our systems without authorization and claimed to have acquired certain data. So the fact that they've claimed and that they've made contact with, with this company means that they are threatening to ex, you know, ex, uh, release the data and they're trying to extort them for it, um, is what I would surmise. The investigation is ongoing and they're in the process of preparing to comply with its obligations with respect to the extracted data. What does that mean? So that typically means that they're in the process of doing remediation and they're assuming that they're not going to pay. The threat actor is going to um, drop information related to operations of the business, customers, employees, and personal data. Um, and yeah, so this is a, a ransom, uh, a ransom style situation, but not ransomware. This is a, an ex like exploitation style attack. So we see a lot of this because frankly, um, it's easier. Like if you can just get the stuff and, and exfiltrate it, it's often easier than like gaining right access to everything and then attempting to destroy it and setting off at a bunch of alarms potentially. Sometimes there are organizations that specifically are just exploitation where they, they just want to exploit you by threatening to release the data. They're not interested in ransom wearing you. Um, and other times they'll do both. You know, they'll really do whichever works and maybe the ransomware part didn't work out or they were caught before that happened. Um, they managed to gain uh, access, they exfiltrated data, but, the, but then before they were able to ransomware everything or maybe during the ransomware attack, they were detected and locked out. That happens pretty commonly. 
So no impact on customer service and business operations. That is the bright side. This is obviously more like reputational risk and managing like, you know, confidential data at this point. It seems as though, you know, as, as we say over at Veronis, you can't unbreach data. So this is uh, once the data is out there, it's really hard to do anything about it. And it looks like uh, Cisco is in the process of figuring out exactly what to do with the exfiltrated, uh, about the exfiltrated data um, and kind of making plans to get a bunch of free credit monitoring, if I had to guess, uh, for anybody involved in the breach. All right, so uh, let's talk about cybercrime infrastructure. We talked a little bit about the snake network. What would be a, a version of the snake network that's instead of dedicated towards like exfiltrating classified data, more focused on folk, uh, like sending a bunch of uh, packets or a bunch of web traffic all to one specific server with the aim of stressing it or taking it down? Well, that is the denial of service, um, distributed denial of service kind of business model where a bunch of infected computers are all able to be targeted for hire at a specific service in order to stress it out, take it down, or cause it to be unavailable to customers. So the way that these typically spread is flaws in like networking devices or other powerful like gateway devices that allow the attacker to get a lot of firepower for what they are infecting. So sometimes we'll see like virtual systems be the target of this, but in this case, it's back to kind of traditional networking devices that are the target of this. This is a ruckus wireless admin panel that has a flaw that allows you to just send an unauthenticated HTTP GET request in order to take over this device. So all you gotta do is do a scan on the internet, locate these things and send a GET request and boom, you are the administrator of this device. And in this case, it looks like it's been used by a group that is specifically setting up a denial, a distributed denial of service, um, service uh, that, allows you to rent this out and then attack other devices. So just kind of notable how simple this attack is. This is in fact um, the exactly what you would need to do uh, in order to take over a device. Um, and it, it really isn't much. This is, you know, you could post this in a tweet. So um, just if you've been curious about the way that these sorts of botnets get started, it's often these sorts of flaws in networking or gateway devices that allow um, projects like this to start targeting and then attacking these devices and kind of rallying them into a big botnet they can use to make money. Which leads us over to the FBI attempting to take these things down. So a lot of these various services have websites that they use to get in touch with customers and take orders. Um, and a lot of them have been taken down with banners like this. So uh, I is this, okay, I don't know if this, I guess this is, okay, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to tell like whether it's the, the logo of the website that's been taken down or like a law enforcement partner, but this one looks cool. I, I enjoy that. Um, anyway, so this has been going up as a result of Operation Power Off, which is an ongoing attempt to attack these distributed denial of service for hire um, like operations. And what's a little bit discouraging is that a lot of the um, URLs that were seized this time are actually just reincarnations of previous ones. So these are ones that like, you know, kind of like don't really um like mean that it's been taken down even necessarily for even that long it just means that they were able to take down like a well-known domain for this even though they typically remain accessible over tor or through like other services all right we're kind of running out of time let's see what else we got all right so this is kind of a technical thing we were talking about how msi got popped a couple of weeks ago and speculating on what this could mean and it seems like negotiations have not gone well with the uh, ransoming party it uh, seems like the Intel boot guard private keys now have been leaked. And what that means is if you are relying on some security features, like the ability to block the installation of malicious uh, UEFI firmware, that is no longer going to work on MSI devices. So this article is a tiny bit confusing because like sometimes uh, Intel is saying, you know, this only affects MSI devices. It doesn't affect Intel. Whereas MSI is saying like this affects more than MSI devices. Um, it looks as though uh, the attackers are demanding a $4 million ransom and after not getting it, have started to release this. And this basically breaks the security for firmware protection. It makes it so that with one of these forged keys, somebody could write their own firmware and successfully upload it and be able to get a foothold on a system that otherwise would not be possible. Now, typically this involves like having direct access to a computer, but hey, like there are ways that this could still happen. Um, Kind of a, a an interesting example of what happens when you don't pay the ransom. The fallout from this is obviously like now a new attack is possible against this type of device. 
while it might not be a super easy attack, it is one that's dangerous because it bypasses security that has been built into the device uh, and that has been pretty effective up until this point uh, at stopping these sorts of attacks. So now that somebody has broken in and stolen the private keys and released them, it's going to be virtually impossible to stop these sorts of firmware installations on this specific type of computer. Kind of sucks. And then I think this is probably the last story we have time for today. Um, Microsoft is enforcing number matching to fight MFA fatigue attacks. So what is an MFA uh, fatigue attack? So I had kind of like forgotten that this was a thing, but imagine it's the middle of the day. You are trying to go about your work and all of a sudden you start getting a bunch of um, like two-factor uh, authentication notices where it's like, do you want to sign in? Do you want to sign in? Do you want to sign in? And all you have to do is tap yes. Um, the problem is that a lot of the times threat actors will rely on people either hitting yes by accident, not fully reading the prompt, or just flooding them with these uh, periodically so that at a, at a certain point, it's either kind of likely that you hit yes by accident or um, it, it just like becomes so annoying that you press yes in order to make it go away. That's the way that somebody who steals your account information could potentially make it so that you, um, you know, just hit yes and then you get into the account. So, or they get into your account. So this has been such a problem. Um, it's called push bombing or MFA push scam. Um, just flooding the target with mobile, mobile notifications, asking them to approve. Um, this is something that Google has actually recently changed too. I, I noticed that this is something that I'd never seen before. And then suddenly when I'm logging into an account, it doesn't just ask me to hit yes. It now asks me to confirm with the number. So what does that actually look like? So when you're already signed in on a device, you will get a notification that says, do you want to sign in on this new device? Do you want to approve it? And usually it says yes or no. Instead, they are now pushing this, where it'll have a number pop up for you, and you need to communicate that number to the device that's attempting to join your account. So that is different from just you know hitting yes. And there's no real possible way for the um, victim to communicate this number to the attacker without being at least aware that somebody is trying to sign into their account or that like the, the number is being requested and another device needs it. This is a, a step harder than you know just hitting yes or just bombing someone over and over with these because you still need to get this number in order to sign into their account. Making stealing their credentials and uh, bombing them with these credentials, not very effective anymore. So um, again, Google, I believe, has has started doing this relatively recently because I see these on my Google account, like sign-in alerts now. Seems like Microsoft is rolling this out for people who might otherwise potentially be victims of this sort of thing um, because it's becoming increasingly popular and it does seem to be effective to just spam people with these sign-in requests and hope that they accidentally hit yes. Kind of dumb, but uh, it does work and it seems as though it is now going to work a little bit less effectively. All right, so that is about all the time we have on this stream. I'm going to do my best to drop some of these link, uh, links into here, make sure that we have uh, a good conversation we can carry on on the Discord server. And if you didn't get it, I will, of course, drop the Discord server link in the chat again. It's good to see everyone. And uh, yeah, I um, hope that we can continue the conversation on there. I also, of course, per usual, want to give a shout out to Veronis, who is the sponsor of the stream, letting me spend my time with you every week. This week, I think we're still going on the data security posture management. If you want to go to veronis.com slash Cody, that's me. I did that. Uh, you can check out the uh, DSPM workshop happening on May 24th. That's still coming up. Uh, it's going to be talking about how major companies position themselves to make sure they don't get popped when they do get breached. It's kind of con considered to be inevitable that companies are going to get breached or that someone is going to get their credentials stolen or their device infected. It's more of a posture of how you can make sure that your data is set up in a way that even if one person or even like a couple computers get breached, it doesn't affect the entire organization. So check it out if you're interested. You'll get one CPE credit and it's always nice to support the sponsor. So head on over to veronas.com slash Cody because they do check how many people click that link. And uh, I would appreciate it very much. So we will see all of you for the next session on Wednesday where we're going to be doing our Q&A. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to leave it either on the YouTube channel. You can shoot, shoot it at me at Twitter if you want to. I think I already have a question on uh, Twitter that I'm going to be responding to. But preferably, if you really want to, go ahead and drop it on our new Discord server where I will make sure it is not only answered, but I will also make sure that other people are able to find the answer in the future if it's a really good question. So thank you to everybody for hanging out with us today. I uh, saw a lot of good activity in the chat. And hopefully I see you all on the Wednesday Q&A stream where we'll be able to answer all of your questions, especially if you have any about anything we've covered today. 
happy to answer it. And I think uh, maybe we'll have maybe we'll have a guest again. All right. See you next time, everyone. Bye.